Hi guys, uh, it's great to be here today. I want to first give a huge thank you to Oxford Nanopore for organizing this incredible conference and inviting me back here to speak. Uh, so I'm going to be talk to, talking to you about our work, yes, using uh, the Cas9 enrichment protocol to look at regions of interest. And we're using this to look at multiple features, including uh, structural variations, point mutations, and CPG methylation. And, and we have loci that we're interested in, which are actually clinically actionable. And that's why we want to generate this high coverage data, because that makes analysis of all of these features a lot more facile, especially looking at single point mutations. As we heard yesterday, when you have uh, higher coverage data, it makes it a lot easier to generate a consensus sequence. And so we've heard about this protocol a couple times, but I want to just go over how it works really briefly. So if you have a region that you're interested in, which I'm showing here is this little green ROI, region of interest, uh, at the center in this soup of DNA mo molecules, so I've got some background DNA, the first thing that we do is we dephosphorylate all the free DNA ends so that we don't have any free 5' phosphate sites, so that when we introduce a cut with Cas9, the only, or at least we should have a dramatic enrichment for free 5' phosphate sites at the site of the Cas9 cleavage, so that then we can use this, these unique 5' phosphate sites surrounding our region of interest to ligate our nanopore sequencing adapters prior to loading this to the nanopore sequencer. So we get data that looks something like this. So this is uh, showing one region, the GST pi 1 gene, which is this tiny gene in the middle, and we've got a region of 18 KB between our two guide RNAs. So what you see in red are reads that align to the forward strand, and what you see in blue are reads that align to the reverse strand. So this, uh, these yellow triangles represent our cut sites, and what you'll see is that you get a lot of reads going into the region that we're interested in, starting from this cut site, but you get also a small number of reads going in the opposite direction. So this happens when uh, the sequencing adapters get ligated not only to the site um, going into our region of interest, but also on the other side where the Cas9 stays remain tightly bound. We still get a, a like a sorry, <laughs> we still get a fraction of sequencing adapters ligating to that site, although it's a much much smaller portion. And then similarly, we get uh, when we make cuts on the other side. In this case, we have a, a lot fewer reads that are ligating to the other side of the Cas9 cleavage site. So we use this uh, method to design a panel um, of, of regions that we're interested in. So I selected 10 sites that I thought would be interesting to look at structural variation. So two of these are for looking at structural variation, three cancer driver genes, uh, RAS, RAF, and TP53, as well as 10 genes that we thought would be interesting to look at methylation in. And so what you see here is the coverage data that we got from a min-ion flow cell. We got coverage ranging from lowest at 20x to up to the highest at uh, 235x at the uh, TP53 site, starting with three micrograms. And this is using the GM12878 cell line. We use this because this cell line is really well characterized, so we can use this to confirm any uh, single nucleotide change that we see, as well as any structural variations. And so from the min-ion flow cell, you get coverage that looks like this. We also performed uh, similar studies on a fungal flow cell. And so even from this tiny flow cell where we're getting, uh, we can generate a lot less sequencing data, we still can generate a substantial amount of coverage. So in this case, the coverage ranges from uh, the lowest of 10x at chromosome 5 up to 65x in this case of the GPX1 gene. And so here's, a, here's a, what all the data looks like at all five sequencing runs that we did. So the three uh, breast cell lines are shown at the right, as well as here the GM12878 cell line. So we get a total of about 60 reads, generally from the min-ion flow cell, sorry, 60,000 reads to 70,000 reads from the min-ion flow cell, although there is this one outlier, the MDA MB231. We think that that's because the cell line is super aneuploid, so we're getting a lot more reads from that cell line. And then the on-target, but that increase in read number didn't translate to a lot larger increase in uh, on-target read amounts. We still got similar amounts. We got the MCF10A cell line. But once again, we get a huge amount of variability in the number of uh, on-target reads that we get, ranging from the min-ion from about 1,300 to the 4,500, and an on-target fraction of about 2 to 7%. And so we, when we did some systematic analysis to look at where all those off-target reads are, those 95% of reads that don't align to our regions, we didn't see any, any evidence that it was off-target cleavage by Cas9. So what we think is happening is that the DNA is getting broken just during manipulation, which is causing ligation of the sequencing adapters to those off-target sites. So looking at these, uh, I'm getting a lot of breath sound. Maybe you can turn me down just a little bit. Thanks, Stuart. <laughs> Um, so when we I'm going to use these uh, breast cell lines to look at structural variation. So I had a colleague, Isaac Lee, who I'm going to talk more about in just a second. And he did uh, whole genome sequencing on these cell lines um, using nanopore sequencing. And he found some evidence of what looked like structural variation. And so I flanked those supposed deletion break sites by about 5 kb on either side. And what I hope you can see is that in the non-tumorogenic MCF10A cell line, we don't see any evidence of structural variation. But in this triple negative breast cell line, MDA MB231, 
we see some reads that go into the deletion site, whereas we have other reads that start on one side and then continue on the other side. Whereas in the MCF7 line, we don't see any reads that go into the deletion breakpoint. So we took this as evidence that the, in the MDA MB231 cell line, that this is a heterozygous deletion and a homozygous deletion in the MCF7. So then we pass this data to the Sniffle Structural Variant Caller, which we've heard about multiple times this week, um, which was developed by our friend and colleague, Fritz Sedlicek. And this identified, uh, as we might predict from these plots, uh, the deletions as heterozygous in the MDA MB231 and homozygous in the MCF7 cell line. So we, we tried to then extend this to look at even larger deletions. So in the GM12878 cell line, there are a few heterozygous deletions that are very large, greater than 50 kb. And because, uh, because this cell line, when it was sequenced, they also sequenced uh, the, pa the donor's mother and father, we know where all of the variants uh, generated, wh where all the variants originated. So what, what we can do is we can say, uh, is this read from the patient's, sorry, from the donor's uh, chromosome 5 that they inherited from their mother or the, or the donor's chromosome 5 that they inherited from the father? We can assign all the reads to the parental allele. So what you can see here is uh, in this chromosome 5 deletion, uh, the deletion is present on the paternal allele. And so in this case, the distance between the two cut sites is going to be about 10 kb, as opposed to the maternal allele, where it's going to be about 80 kb. And this leads to a huge difference in coverage. So on the paternal allele, we get greater than 400x coverage, whereas on the maternal allele, it dips to about 25x in the middle. And then on uh, chromosome 6, it's the opposite case with the deletions presence on the maternal allele. And once again, we get a dip to 25x in the middle, but greater than 200x. And then this even larger deletion is greater than 155 kb. We don't get any reads that span the whole region. What we think is happening is that we're losing the DNA in our final step. Those long strands, we think they're getting stuck to the ampere beads. So we're very interested in uh, using uh, alternative methods, for instance, the kits by circulomics, to try and increase our recovery of those long reads. But I don't have any data for you on that today. But uh, despite this difference in coverage between the two alleles, when we pass this data to the Sniffle Structural Variant Caller, it still does identify these reads, uh, these deletions correctly and assigns them as heterozygous. Uh, so now moving on to talking about how we can use this method to identify single nucleotide changes. We've been, uh, we've, when you, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> looking here, this is just a IGV plot of some raw nanopore reads. And you can see that the data is relatively noisy, as I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. But what I want to point out is that we getting, we're getting a different series of k-mers from the reads of the line to the forward strand and the reads of the line to the reverse strand. Um, so that, that leads to a different error profile on each of the two strands. But we, and this is a feature that we're going to use to try and um, further refine our ability to call single nucleotide variants. And, but because the reads are inherently noisy, we're limiting our analysis just to look at single nucleotide changes, so single base substitutions. Uh, and I want to comment that this analysis was hugely improved with the release of the most recent flip-flop base color, but that we do still have some persisting difficulties looking at uh, low-complexity homopolymer regions. So we called variants using two methods, both using just the uh, raw sequence alignment as well as the sequencing data, or using the nail polish algorithm, which uses the alignment as well as going back to interrogate the raw electrical signal. And uh, I used all eight regions that we enriched for, which have a total size of about 140 kb, where 176 uh, single nucleotide variants exist. And astonishingly, with this new flip-flop base collar, uh, SAM tools alone was able to identify uh, almost all of the variants. So we're getting 96, 97% uh, of our variants identified both by SAM tools and nanopolish. And even when we, and so we had an average coverage about 100x across all sites with uh, the min-ion. With the lower coverage data that we get from the flongal, so in this case we have about 30x coverage, the sensitivity is, is lower in both cases. But in this case, nanopolish, which again is interrogating the electrical signal, um, is much more sensitive. But, so a note that we're getting a lot of the variants, but we're still missing a few. And when we go and look at them, it is, as you might expect, in homopolymer regions. So for instance, uh, this one on the left here, we have a, a T to C transition. But because it's in a homopolymer, almost all of the reads have a deletion at that site, which makes it really difficult for these algorithms to identify variants. And then on the one on the right, we have a G to C transversion. And although it looks like there is evidence of this mutation in the data, because it's flanked by these insertions, it makes it, once again, difficult for these algorithms to identify. I also want to comment that at this point, we're still getting a relatively high amount of false positives. So about 5 to 10% of the variants that we're identifying are not actually present in the data. Uh, and when we, closely, when we interrogate those a little bit more closely, what we see is that frequently it's the result of an error on only one of the two strands. So remember, they're getting a different series of nucleotides whichever, uh, depending on the direction of sequencing happening. So for instance, these two false positives were only present as a result of errors on the negative strand, 
Whereas when you look at the true positives, they're supported by data from both the forward strand and the reverse strand. So using this information, we implemented a dual strand filter requiring variance to be supported by information from both strands. This led to a slight reduction in sensitivity, but nanopolish, in this case, significantly outperformed uh, just using the raw alignment data from sand pools, where we're still maintaining almost 90% uh, of the variance uh, from the minion focel, and, but although, once again, from the flongo, it's a lot less sensitive. We did have this one persisting false positive when we were trying to identify variance using the nanopolish data, and when we look at that more closely, it does seem to be in a very uh, T-dense region. So although some of the other variants that we're misidentifying hopefully will be resolved with the release of the new dual-headed R10 um, nanopore, this one might still give us a little bit of issue. And then uh, lastly, I just want to talk about um, our use of this method to uh, look at DNA methylation. Uh, so DNA methylation is part of the epigenetic milieu, which is, uh, helps to regulate gene transcription. When we think about when a gene is methylated at its promoter, it's being condensed, it's being transcriptionally inactive. I probably don't need to tell anyone here that nanopore uh, directly interrogates DNA, which lets us look at modified nucleotides. But I do want to emphasize one more time that that's actually clinically actionable, that DNA methylation can be informative for disease states and predictive of disease outcomes. So <laughs> when, we look at <laughs> when we look at a comparison of whole genome bisulfate sequencing in this GM12878 cell line, um, this is just one example region. We're comparing the Illumina data versus the methylation data that we got from both the minion and the flongo. We see very similar patterns. Uh, I'll, I should note that DNA methylation is inherently a little bit noisy, so we've used this uh, smoothing line to show kind of the overall methylation patterns. And although it's noisy overall, we note that right at the gene promoter, there's a, a, a big consensus that all of the methods seem to agree. So what this kind of implies to us is that there's less intercell variability at sites where DNA methylation is super important for gene regulation. And I also want to comment that uh, the minion pattern and the flongal pattern closely resemble each other, which kind of implied to us that even the low coverage data that we get from the flongal is able to tell us about DNA methylation patterns. Uh, and so I have this really talented colleague, Isaac Lee. He's kind of a unicorn in that he's skilled at both bench work and computational work. And what he did is he developed a pipeline, and he's released this tool which takes the nanopolish calls that are, uh, takes the methylation calls that result from nanopolish, and then applies that to the nanopore read. So it's kind of doing like an in silico bisulfite conversion to make it really easy to visualize the methylation patterns on the nanopore reads using IGV. So as opposed to here, where we're looking at like a, a aggregate of all the DNA methylation patterns, we can look at each of the reads individually and see and, and visualize directly on the reads what the methylation uh, CVG methylation was. And so the reason we picked GST pi 1 is because this is a, an important gene in cancer. Uh, we, it's known that in like triple negative breast cancer that this gene is highly active and driving and that in estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, this gene is highly methylated. Uh, when this gene is highly methylated, it's associated with bad outcomes. And that's exactly what we see in our cell lines. So in a, a non-tumorogenic MCF10A cell line, this gene's unmethylated. In this triple negative breast cancer line, unmethylated and active. And then our estrogen receptor positive cell line, this gene is highly methylated, which wouldn't be indicative of a bad outcome. Similarly with keratin-19, this is a gene that, um, <coughs> detection of this gene is done uh, both in circulating uh, tumor cells as well as looking for metastasis to local lymph nodes. Um, and uh, expression of this gene is associated with bad outcomes in cancer. And when we look, we see that in both of our cancerous cell lines, this gene is hypomethylated and highly expressed, whereas in the non-tumorogenic MCF10A, this gene is highly methylated. So uh, moving forward, what we want to do is, right now, when we're looking at structural variants, uh, we kind of have to know where they are. So we want to tile these guide RNAs across the larger regions so that we can look for structural variants in a more agnostic approach over a wider region. Uh, so for instance, right now, we're only targeting really up to 20, 30 KB. We want to be able to look over megabases at a time to survey for any structural variation changes. Uh, we also want to alternate our cleanup steps to hopefully get more of those long reads, uh, and also barcodes that we can include multiple samples on a single flow cell, really increasing the throughput and the cost of this assay. So I've hoped that I've convinced you that we can use this method to look for structural variations, uh, that we can also look for single nucleotide changes, although we do still have a little bit of a challenge in the homopolymeric regions. And also, I hope that you've seen that we can use ca this Cas9 enrichment approach to look for DNA methylation and a facile means at regions of interest. And with that, I want to thank Oxford and Anapur, especially uh, the folks who helped develop this protocol, James, Rebecca, Etienne, and, An and Andy. I want to thank my boss, Winston, and my colleague, Isaac Lee, who developed the IGV methylation plot viewer, uh, Fritz Sethercheck, developer of Sniffles, and uh, Michael Schatz on my PhD advising committee. Thank you.